Welcome. Uh, my name is Chuck. I am an accidental sysadmin. It's been three months since my last formatting of the wrong hard drive on a server. Thank you. I was worried that that wouldn't land. Anyway, seriously, uh, I'm the lead for a team developing uh, system software at a big corporation. Uh, the nature of what we do means that we have a fair number of servers and switches and other network and storage appliances uh, that are there to support our testing and development. Um, this supports about a, a team of about 10 of us doing this, this stuff. And up until recently, we had a lovely IT department that took care of all of our needs. So this meant they provided lab space to house all of this equipment. They provided the top of rack switches. They took care of all of the IP address stuff. And they worried about DNS, and it's always DNS, and DHCP. Um, they set up user accounts for us and maintained all of the passwords and that sort of thing. And they would also set up these development VMs for us, where each of the developers would do their work. So this is all pretty, pretty normal and it worked very well until we got the conjunction of two events. As big corporations are bound to do, there was a reorg, but it also coincided with a building consolidation. So the reorg probably wasn't a big deal. Uh, the product that we were working on was getting moved to a different division, but it was still very closely associated with our old division, so we were still working together and that was fine. The building consolidation was a bigger problem because the lab that housed all of our equipment was now being gotten rid of. And the new location uh, was smaller. And so the old group's IT group suddenly decided that they did not have space for our equipment. And they needed us out in 90 days. So we were being evicted from our lab. Now, the new business unit that we were going to, they had an IT staff, they had lab space for us to move our equipment in, but it was halfway across the country. And given the nature of our work, which involved a lot of hands-on stuff, so moving cables, adding memory to systems, swapping out drives, moving servers around, all that sort of stuff, would have been terrible. We would have had to file tickets for everything, and that sounded miserable. But the alternative was also equally scary. This meant that suddenly now we had to provide all of this support that was now missing. And when we were deliberating exactly what to do, I remembered a talk from Meet BSD way back where WhatsApp talked about how they ran their fleet of 800 servers with a staff of 12. And importantly, they credited FreeBSD's stability and performance as the reason that they were successful doing that with such a small staff. So our fleet was not nearly that large. We were less than 10% of probably what WhatsApp was doing. But when you look at the ratio of staff to servers, that felt about right. And so what we did was we embarked on this journey to produce a facsimile of kind of the infrastructure that we disappeared. So what I'm gonna talk about today is how we took FreeBSD and the various services that it provides to uh, fill the hole created by our untimely eviction. So let's talk about the goals. Um, Basically, it was, it was three really simple things. So we wanted to keep the user experience. So all of our users that, were, that had been doing stuff in this lab, we wanted to make that as, as, this, as seamless as possible, as a little of a disruption for them. So what does this involve? This was a single sign-on. So it, be able to use your password or the password to log into any of the systems in the lab. Also wanted to have the each user's home directory available everywhere. Same sort of thing. Log into a rando system, your user directory is there so you can do your stuff. We needed centralized management. And 
And by that, what I mean really is that every time there was a new user or somebody updated their password, we didn't want to go to every freaking system and change it there. So we needed it centralized. And then the final one was we needed these virtual desktops for the developers to do their thing. Now, the other important part of this was we did not want to modify the existing Linux systems. So all of these systems that we had, they were doing a thing. And it was an important thing, and it was a good thing, and we didn't want to change that thing. So this wasn't a opportunity to start from scratch. So this was definitely fit into the way these servers expected everything to work. And then finally, automation was really important. So there was secondary fallout from the uh, reorg, so we actually lost some staff. Um, but now that we were doing all of this lab stuff, we had two jobs. So we had the thing that, that Big Corp was paying us to do, and then we had the care and feeding of this, this fleet of servers. And so if we could minimize the amount of care and feeding that we had to do, we could actually focus on our real job. So let's look at what this system, uh, what, this, what this looked like. So given that the, uh, what I refer to as the old country, our, our previous uh, business unit, since they were having their own difficulties, they were not in particularly a sharing mood to explain to us how all of their infrastructure worked. So there was a lot of inferring that we needed to do uh, to figure out exactly what this infrastructure looked like. And so that, that will be a running theme of, of poking at stuff to figure out what exactly we needed to do. So really, to figure out what our server requirements were, we started with the Linux clients themselves and basically looked at what they were needing and worked our way backwards to what we would have to provide to support that. So to start off, um, the way these systems got set up was they would uh, install them via remote media. So this would just be a generic kind of Linux install. And then they would co copy this tarball over to the system. It had a customized, a shell script to customize the system. And so what that involved were things like setting up the time zone, pointing to the corporate NTP server. Uh, they created a slash users directory. Um, they installed a, a handful of packages. Uh, the two important ones that we'll talk about are AutoFS and NIS. They set up the NIS domain name and then they copied a bunch of files into slash Etsy. So this would be system configuration stuff. Uh, so this was uh, password and group and shadow and all that kind of stuff. And then going in and looking at some of the bash shell history, you could see that there were a large number of files that they edited by hand and did something to. So we had a list of, of those that, that, that we could go look at. But after we kind of did this initial look at stuff, th there were still a couple things that weren't clear. So one of the big ones was how were user directories getting mounted under slash users? Because there wasn't any real indication of how that was working. And then we knew there was an NFS server somewhere, but none of the config files really showed how that was, was, was playing into things. Okay, so let's first let's talk about NIS. This is one of the packages that, that got installed. Uh, NIS is, stands for Network Information Services. This is a type of directory service. And a directory service is just a fancy computer science term that describes mapping a network resource to a specific address. Now, originally this was called uh, Yellow Pages, and then Lawyers. Um, so it's, it's not called yellow pages anymore, but that is why you'll see a bunch of these commands prefixed with YP. That's, what, that's what's going on there. Um, it is a client server protocol to distribute system configuration data. So for example, the passwords for all of the users. But at its heart, it is a distributed key value store. So in the case of the password, the key would be the user that it's trying to get the password information from. Now, these, these keys, so like a, a, a username that maps to their, their password information, a bunch of those related keys are a, what NIS refers to as a map. 
And so you'll have different maps. So you have maps for users and maps for groups and hosts and, and all that sort of stuff. So let's take a look at what one of these requests would look like. So what we have here is a Wireshark capture of a client asking a server for a password. Um, NIS is, is called, uh, referred to as a remote procedure call. This is basically making a very similar to a function call that you would make in a normal program, but it is proxy to a server on the, on the other side. So here the procedure that it, we're, it's doing is match. That's basically saying, find me this key. And this is the key that it's looking for down here at the bottom is Bob. So Bob is trying to log into this system. And the map that we're gonna try to look up Bob's information in is the password. And the, the domain is kind of the other interesting thing to look at here. So a, a collection of similar maps is called a domain in, in NIS terms. So all the way through, it's look up Bob's key, get his password in this particular domain. So the server gets that, and what comes back is exactly, if you've ever looked at Etsy password or master.password, it's returning this information at the bottom. So it's Bob, their hash password, their user directory, and their preferred shell. Okay. And pretty much all of the other RPCs kind of work very similarly. Different maps and, that's, and different keys, but, but very similarly. So now the question is, which of these maps do we need to provide? Um, so again, we, we come back to asking the system, what do you have? One of the commands uh, that NIS provides is this thing called ypwitch, and that tells you which is the authoritative server for a particular map. Or you can do like I show here, you can issue uh, the ypwitch without any particular map. And what it does is it returns every single map that it knows about. So the format here that we're looking at is the map name is in the left-hand column and the right-hand column is the NIS server that is providing this. And when I ran that against um, the uh, old countries uh, NIS server, it returned about two dozen different maps. So then the question is, okay, which one of these are we gonna use? Now, the, the, the easy answer is it was really these four sets of things. So we wanted the, the password map, we needed the group map, and then there were these two auto dot maps. Um, there's a reasonable question of, of how do we figure that out? There's another NIS tool called YPCAT it works very similarly to the Unix cat utility. You can point it at a map and it dumps out the contents. And then it's a matter of kind of going through it and trying to figure out what this thing is showing. So in a lot of cases, it was showing systems that we would no longer have access to, so don't worry about those. Um, services that the, some of those systems provided, those are gone too. Uh, occasionally, you'd run across things like, oh, hey, there's my user ID. We probably want this one. Um, or we found another one that had a uh, NFS in the server name. So we felt like that was pretty interesting as well. Okay, so now we have our, our hit list of maps that we need to go create. So then the question is, how do you create them? And this is literally a build process. So you go into uh, the var yp directory and run make. So it's all driven by a make file. Here you can see that on our replacement server that I've called Mo, uh, you run make. It turns out that we'd made some changes to auto.master and users. It did all of its stuff, it built things, and it, it updated the server. So to get this to, to do the build process, you actually need to create the source files that generate the maps. Then there are a couple of local config operations, or config options that we're gonna, gonna need to uh, set. And then you run YP init to, to do the whole thing. So let's talk about creating the map sources. One thing to know is that a single NIS server can actually support multiple domains. And so one of the, the recommendations is to partition your map source files into domain-specific directories. So 
that's what we're doing here um, at uh, Big Corp. The domain name convention was, you know, Big Corp dot the group name. So uh, under Etsy YP source, we created a Big Corp dot outcast domain. And so in there, we're going to need a source for our group, create a new group ID for everybody. Need to create a password so all of the users have their accounts and passwords. And then there's this auto stuff. And we'll come back to that. OK, we'll start with the easy one. So in the group file, uh, we're, we're changing into our etsyyp source bigcorp.outcast. And we're just going to echo stuff to that group file. Um, this is the normal group uh, format where you have the group name followed by the group ID. Um, we picked this number because this is what we used in the old group. Um, and this was OK for a, a couple of reasons, or actually good for a couple of reasons. One, there would be no interaction with the other groups, so there wasn't really going to be any conflict. But secondly, all of the files that we had written already had that group number associated with, so everything would, would port over pretty seamlessly. Next, we want to look at the, the password stuff. Now, we saw that the map that was being provided was password, but FreeBSD actually creates password from master.password. Um, so we needed to set up a master.password. Uh, we bootstrap this process by asking the old NIS server for the entries uh, for the existing users. So here we're using uh, YP match. We're giving it a list of the users. We're telling it, yeah, we want the um, passwords. And we're going to uh, redirect that into a local file. Um, you can think of YP match a little bit like grep. Give it a pattern, it'll match it for you. So the complication here comes in that the format of password is different than master.password. Um, kind of at a, at a very high level, uh, password is the original uh, format that, that the early BSDs used. Uh, it includes the, well, on a, on a running system, that is the user or the widely readable version of the identity for the system users. So that can be read by everyone. So importantly, it doesn't include a hashed copy of the password. That's what ends up in, in master.password. So you kind of have this, this split. Linux does something very similar. So their, their password is similar to uh, FreeBSDs in that it doesn't include the hash password. And then Shadow uh, has the hash stuff. The, uh, the, the glitch here is that the format of master.password is not the same as password. But uh, we can use awk to fix all of this. And actually, very helpfully, you go to the man page for password, and the awk script is right there. So we run uh, uh, the awk script against our old country password by name, and then uh, output that to var yp master.password. Um, some folks might be looking at this and going, well, why are you generating, putting master.password in, in, not with the other sources? It's a great question. I don't know the answer. The build wanted it there, so we put it there. OK, so we, we've done the easy stuff. Um, we have group. We have users. Now we have to look at this AutoFS thing. So AutoFS is a facility, kind of a user, some user space stuff and some kernel space stuff to automatically mount things based on rules. So what sort of things does this include? So this is everything from removable media, so like in putting a CD-ROM in or a USB drive and getting that file system automatically mounted on your system. Uh, file share, so like Samba and NFS, it can automatically mount for you. Same thing for uh, other file systems like the FTP and SSHFS. And it also does things like support media transfer protocol, which is, if you have an Android phone means you can plug your phone in and it'll detect stuff. So this is the mechanism that we're going to use to mount 
users' home directories. So the, this is all on the client side. So this, this is all on the Linux systems. And the rules live in Etsy auto.master. So we went to one of the Linux systems and we looked at it and the contents of it are just this one line. It says plus auto.master. And what this rule is saying is it wants to retrieve the contents of auto.master from NIS. That's what the little plus sign is. And you'd actually see that plus sign get used in the local version of the uh, Etsy password and, and group files on the Linux client. Basically says, look up anything else in, in NIS. Okay, cool. cool. So what's in auto.master? Uh, so again, we're running ypcat. Uh, the two other new options here, uh, one, it dumps out the key also along with the contents that just makes it a little easier to piece together what's going on, and then the T kind of removes some of the, um, the aliasing. And so what we're getting from the output of this is it shows the mount point, the map that you're going to use, and any options. So when we dump the contents of auto.master, it's saying, for all mount points under users, you're going to use the auto.users map, and you're going to pass these options to mount. OK, cool. So what the heck is in auto.users? So you do the same sort of thing, and it spews. This list went on for hundreds and hundreds of entries. And basically, this was giving us every single user in uh, the old countries uh, group uh, their uh, basically every single username, and then it was basically a repetition. So every single one of these mount options was almost identical. So what this is showing, for example, we take the look at the first one. We have Alice, uh, the user Alice, and we have some mount options for her. Uh, the last part is where to mount this from. So this is saying we're going to go to the Big Corp NFS server and look under disk data and users. Now that, that ampersand at the end is a little bit of uh, syntactic sugar. What it says, what that ampersand means is go ahead and substitute the key that you were looking up for this. So in our case, if we're looking up Alice, that turns into user slash Alice. Um, it, its format is, is, is slightly different. You get the key, you get the mount options, and you get the location. Now, fortunately, um, it provides some other nice little syntactic things that really allowed us to simplify this file. So you can actually say star and then give everything. And the star says for any key that comes in, this is the mount options that you're going to use, which were the same for all of these anyway. And then it's, it's a very similar sort of thing. So we can say we're going to point at Mo, which is our replacement server. And you're going to use slash users. And then the ampersand, again, substitutes in the key name. So we get Mo slash users slash, um, slash Alice. So this is, so using AutoFS is, is the way that we're going to be able to do this. So, the, so kind of winding all the way back, that, that password request that we looked up, that gave them their hash password, but it also gave them their user directory. And so when they were successfully authenticated, they would log in, change directory to slash user slash Alice, which triggered AutoFS to look up its set of rules to resolve that to the NFS server that had their directory and automatically mount it. And so what this does is this, lets you dynamically add users' directories to the system that they logged into. And then after they've been off that system for a reasonable amount of time, those, those entries disappear. So it keeps it fairly neat, neat and tidy. All right, so now we've created all of our sources. Let's take a look at the local build configurations that we need to do. So this is a part of the build. The var yp stuff is, is distributed as a part of the OS. So it's actually structured so that you don't need to change the bits 
that are coming with the operating system. So when, when the operating system gets updated, you're not, up, you're not having to trash files that are, that are there. So as a part of this, the build looks for this makefile.local, and it lets you put your build options or your configuration options that you want for the build in there. So we only really needed three to make our, our environment work. Uh, one is, the first one is YP source store. So this is a, basically a way to say, here's where you're gonna find all of the map sources. Now, because we're only supporting a single domain, putting this in here was fine for us. It saved me a step. If you were supporting multiple domains, you probably wouldn't wanna do this and you'd pass this in as a part of the build. So you'd run make and then set YP source on, on, the, the, make, on the command line. The second one here is unsecure is true. It's not a typo. I don't know, it looks funny to me too, but it's fine. Um, unsecure true means that the domain basically includes some non-FreeBSD clients. So the FreeBSD version of NIS is very good about how, it, how and when it transfers passwords over, but not everybody is, works the same way as FreeBSD. And so for, for uh, clients that can't handle the separation of trusted and untrusted, Unsecure says, yeah, go ahead and include the hash version of the password in, in the password map. Um, and then the last option that we have here is shadow, basically unsetting shadow. Um, given the way that, that our Linux systems were initially configured, we needed to, to do this. Um, so that was the easy ones. So uh, by default, FreeBSD doesn't come with rules to create the uh, AutoFS maps that we needed. And here you kind of get into a choice. So we could have added new, so you need new rules to build these, these two maps. So you can either put them into the makefile.local, but that means you're gonna have to end up running a second build step to, to, to get things to, to generate those things, just because of the, the way the includes work. And actually, it may actually break the build because of where it gets included. Um, the other option is to just modify the existing makefile yourself and just bite the bullet in pain of, of, of upgrades. So that's what we did. Um, just copied the, or adapted the, the uh, rules from the, the net group to build these, these two maps for us. And with that, now all of the clients can log into, uh, all of the clients can authenticate to our NIS server. Everybody can use in, uh, can log in, and nobody has a home directory, which is, which is bad. So let's fix that next. So, uh, we've muttered a little bit about NFS. If you've never heard of NFS, it's, that stands for the Network File System. Effectively, that's making a directory, that a file system that is available on the server available to clients over the network. And the super cool thing is it doesn't really matter what the local file system is. So in our case, um, the user's home directories were all physically on Mo. Uh, the fact that we were using ZFS there was great for us and the clients didn't care. So, uh, like I said, uh, locally we had uh, ZFS uh, with RAID Z2 on fast SSDs. This is a little bit important because um, uh, NFS does synchronous writes, which take longer on spinny disks, so this kind of fixed a little bit of, of that problem. So then the, the next thing you need to do is you need to configure NFS to start exporting all of these, uh, these file systems, or the file systems that you want. Now the traditional way is you go in and you edit Etsy exports. ZFS has a nice feature called share NFS. So you can take a data set that you've created out of uh, ZFS and you set this property called share NFS on it. And really what that is is the options that you would normally set in your uh, Etsy exports for NFS, but it's all right there in, in one place. 
And so the way we, we set up our stuff, we have a, a separate pool for this uh, data that we're using. We create a data set for the users, and then uh, each of the users get a sub data set under there. And so the nice thing is you can just set it at that top level, and then all the children inherit it. So everything gets exported automatically. So now that I've waxed poetically about how Shira NFS keeps me from having to put things in Etsy exports, now we have to put something in Etsy exports. Um, we wanted to use the uh, v4 version of NFS. Uh, it's a little bit more performant. It uh, is not as persnickety as uh, the version 3. It's just generally a better version of the protocol. But to enable that, uh, you have to configure a couple of things. So one, you need to tell it, yeah, we're going to use v4, and then tell it where the root is. So that's what, that's what this, this entry does here. So now that you have that configured, there are a half dozen services that you now need to enable. So you enable the NFS server uh, service and the NFS v4 service. Uh, there's a user D service that you need to enable. And its job is basically to load the users from uh, the user information from user space into the kernel so it can do its thing. And then the last service is this mount D service whose job is to listen to these requests coming in to, to mount stuff. All right, so then, uh, so now everybody has their home directories, everybody can log in. What happens? Uh, how do we keep up with this? So when we get a new user, use the normal password uh, set up to create an account uh, and their password and set their home directory. Then we go in and create the uh, data set for their home directory, shown it to be the right permissions, and then update NIS. I am going to completely weasel out of what exactly that means. Um, there are a couple of ways to do this. I made things work. I'm uncomfortable with what I had to do to make it work. But basically, there, there's some options to PW that you can say, go ahead and, and create this password, and update uh, NIS as a part of that whole thing. I did some things that felt a little bit unnatural, so I'm not really sure that's the right way to do it. It seems to work for us, but your mileage may vary. Go find a real sysadmin. They'll tell you actually what to go do. Um, the other thing that we did was um, make it so that when a user changes their password, they can do it from any system. So to do this, you create this other, you start this other service called uh, YP password D. Um, it's a lot of double letter scores. Um, and that allows them to not have to go to the NIS server specifically to do it. Uh, the one little glitch was uh, there's a minus U option that says listen on unprivileged ports. Um, it turns out that some operating systems, I won't say which, Linux, um, do things on this weird port, or do things on unprivileged ports and expect things to work. FreeBSD has an option to keep you covered, and so uh, you just need to know that. So now, everybody has their home directories, everybody can log in, they can change passwords, uh, life is good. So then, kind of the final piece that, that we need to get in place is something called a virtual desktop. Now, this is big corp slang for a developer's virtual machine. This has all of the tools that they need, the, the compilers and the revision control stuff we need, and you know the blessed version of Chrome for whatever reason. Um, this is where everybody does their development, so everyone has the same environment. Now, this. It we've seen two different divisions, so, and it varies a little bit. So you know, it's like eight to six to eight vCPUs, ten to thirty-two gigs of memory, um, and then the, uh, the 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 unique thing was both of them had these two disk solutions. So there was the disk that you booted off of, and then there was the fast disk, and that's where you did all of your builds off of. So this fast disk, fast disk, um, was a iSCSI one that got mounted by the host and exposed to the guest as, as a, as a uh, direct attach drive. Um, so to reproduce this, uh, fortunately, FreeBSD has a very lovely hypervisor built in called Beehive, so that, that's what we did. 
Um, since we were running off of a uh, fast uh, Z-pool, um, we didn't have to worry about these, you know, a fast drive. All of our VMs just got a single drive and it was actually much faster than the fast drives. Uh, and then finally, it, we used VMB Hive for management. Opinions vary on that. I think it worked just fine for us in our kind of limited set. And then it was, um, we used kind of the normal things uh, to get the VMs up. So UEFI and remote frame buffers so that you could look at your bespoke version of Chrome. And so we did it. So now we have uh, achieved parity with the old setup. Um, one thing I will note here is this was very much not the straight line that hopefully I'm conveying here. Um, the number of, of uh, blind alleys that I found myself in and the uh, number of phone of friends I needed to, to do to get this all fixed was um, staggering. But everything was back up and running. We were out on uh, the old country's time frame. And now that we had our own infrastructure, we can actually make some changes to, uh, to improve things. And so that's what I want to talk about here. So uh, there were a large, there were a good, fairly good number of things that we did to improve our quality of life. Uh, one of the biggest ones was uh, getting Ansible set up to automate a lot of the setup and management. We'll talk about that a bunch. Uh, we also set up an SSH certificate authority uh, and vault. That, that was another big one for us. Um, we also set up a DHCP server. Now, it, it might sound a little funny to call this a uh, automation tool and productivity boost, and you're gonna laugh even harder when I tell you that we don't do any dynamic IP addresses. It's all static. So um, why on earth, Chuck, are you telling me that this was a good thing? Uh, DHCP reservations were a huge productivity gain for us. So what a DHCP reservation is, is it basically binds a MAC address to an IP address. And that we basically set up a reservation in our DHCP server for every IP address interface in, in our lab. Now, that is a bunch of work. There's a little bit of automation you can do to help that. But for us, the big win was skipping the network setup for every install we did, which we do an, un, uh, an unholy amount of, of re-imaging of servers. So this means that I don't have to supply the host name. I don't have to supply the IP address. I don't have to worry about the gateways. I don't have to remember which the good DNS server is in, in all of this. Basically, all of the systems come with DHCP enabled by default, and so you just let them do their thing. But we've actually statically allocated all of it, and it just works. Um, and for this, we used, our needs weren't complicated. OpenBSD's DHCP server has worked great for us. We're quite happy with it. So uh, we also set up a web server. The web server isn't really automation on its own, um, but it's it's, it's a, it's a file server of sorts for the apps that need HTTP. For us, this is a way to distribute packages for PKG and DEBs. Um, and the other thing that we use it a ton for is remote media. So the baseband management controller of your server can be configured to point at a HTTP address that has an ISO sitting there. And then it presents it to the guest as a local uh, drive, and you can now do your install um, over the web. So we use that a ton. Again, OpenBSD's HTTPD worked great. We're super happy with it. Uh, we also set up backups because um, I, I would never hear the end of it if I did this presentation from somebody. Um, and then there were kind of a, a, a bunch of, 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 of other things that were nice. So uh, instead of fighting the the proxy and probably Zscaler, uh, we set up a Docker registry on this server to, to uh, avoid having to go out and uh, retrieve packages to do builds. Um, Athens is a Go proxy um, that serves kind of a very similar uh, purpose. And we set up a TFTP server. 
there were a handful of things that, that needed pixie booting. And so we used that for those. Okay, so let's, let's talk about Ansible. Ansible is software to uh, automate system configuration and software installs. And one of the things that we really like about it is that it is agentless, meaning you don't need to go to a system and install something specifically to go configure it. Now, that said, it does rely on Python and SSH existing, but for most of the systems that we're dealing with, those are already there. Um, the other kind of unique thing about it is you describe the state that you want that system to be in via a playbook. So this is a declarative syntax and it's YAML based. Now, declarative means that you're going to specify the goal without describing the exact steps and versus imperative, which is you spell out every single step on how to achieve a goal. And how this works is you create this inventory. This is a list of every single system that you want it to manage. And one of the powerful things about creating this giant list is being able to group servers. So you can, you can say, hey, this bunch of servers in here are our Ubuntu dev servers. Um, then there are kind of two, ca two categories of things that you can do to use Ansible. So, so the easy one to talk about are these kind of one-off configuration activities. So we have a playbook to go patch and update all of the systems. Uh, we have another one to restart AutoFS because evidently that's a thing. The other category are these are uh, something called roles. And you can think of this kind of in, in terms of the initial system setup. So roles are a collection of playbooks that all do a, a, a specific thing. And you can apply either a playbook or a role to a subset of your inventory. So when you run this, you can say, hey, just do this thing for the Ubuntu dev servers. So for example, here's a, a playbook to patch a system. And so at the top, it's just, there's a name to describe what this silly thing is, and then the tasks tell you what it's gonna do. So the first one is, you know, run apt upgrade to uh, apply the patches that are needed. Uh, the next one is look at this file, see if this var run reboot required exists. If that does exist, then you need to do a system reboot. And the final task is, hey, if that file was there, go ahead and do the system reboot. So we talked about the roles. These are these, these group of, of tasks that are related to a goal. So for our setup, that's things like, hey, is this system gonna be a build server? Is this system an NIS client? And then there's kind of this grab bag of things that all of the systems are gonna need. And so what you end up doing is you end up mapping uh, your, uh, you create the site file that maps your inventory to one of these roles, and then you can just run it against a thing. And what this, the really powerful thing of this is that uh, setup script, this bespoke setup script that we got from the old country, um, this is much better because it adapts to the evolution of these config files. So when you upgrade the OS and there's a different version, this can actually programmatically go in and, and do much smarter stuff. Plus it also allows us to automate uh, more of the process. Now the, the, the big win with Ansible for us um, there, there were a bunch of things that we really liked about. One, it's a force multiplier. So now with the smarts in these scripts, anybody in our group can go run these upgrades. Uh, it also allows us to make changes at scale. So it has this list of servers, so I can re-IP, change the IP address of every single system in our lab, which we've done twice and we're about to do a third time, um, which would be horribly painful if we had to do it by hand. But the other nice aspect about it is this actually documents the how of our infrastructure. How is everything connected? What things matter? And that sort of stuff. And plus, it's, it's, it's widely available and, and there's, there's really good help. So one thing that this um, conversation on Ansible really blew by quickly, I mentioned SSH, but I didn't say which user could run the plays, or how they were authenticated, or how they were authorized to make changes. So I'm gonna run through what our answer to this solution was. 
um, this may or may not fit your circumstances, please consult a certified IT provider before you do something in your own environment. Your mileage may vary, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so for authentication, uh, we have a common sister user, common system user. Uh, it's called Pariah. Um, this user has a common password for all those terrible, really bad, no good days. So when everything goes wrong, when your network goes down, when DNS is deciding to do its thing, you still have a way to get into it. Now we store the uh, password in Vault. Big Corp has very specific rules, so it's not actually running on, uh, on our server, but, but basically it's stored in there. So we try to use public key authentication for everything else. Even, even automation. So we'll go in our SSH config and actually um, disable uh, password authentication for most things. Now, if you have physical access to the console, you can still use the password. That's the, the terrible no good day option. And then to keep our sanity or maintain our sanity, we set up a, a certificate authority. So a certificate of authority's job is really to say, is really to answer the question, do I trust this key? And there are basically two sets of keys that, that come into play here. One, there's the host key that a, proves a system is who it says it is, and there's the user key that you're using to authenticate yourself. And you've all seen examples of when this trust uh, kicks into play. So, for example, uh, we have, an exa we have uh, uh, this user Ubuntu logging into Larry, and SSH is saying, hey, do you trust the authenticity of this server? And similarly, on the user side, when you're doing, you're trying to copy your SSH keys to a server, uh, you'll have to enter your password to prove that you really are who you are. So this is how it works. These are not really communication paths. This is more of a relationship sort of thing. So what happens is a user is going to give its keys to the certificate authority, and it's going to get back a signed certificate. Same thing happens with the host. It's going to pass its host key to the certificate authority and get back a signed cert. So the implicit assumption in here is the users trust the certificate authority and the hosts trust the certificate authority. And so uh, by math, that means now that users can trust hosts. And the way that that practically ends up working is when a user starts talking to a host and a host starts a response to a user, they pass each other certificates that, that were signed by their certificate authority. And since they both trust it, now everybody knows uh, that everything is cool. So the way that this works, so on the host, we're, you're going to pull the, uh, the, the key and the passphrase from BigCorp's vault. You're going to use SSH keygen to sign the host keys. And then you're going to do a bunch of config for the uh, for the SSH server's uh, config file. And so that's including things like pointing at this new certificate and then configuring the principles. So a principle is, it's really just an identifier that's associated with a certificate. Um, it's, it, 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 it's a mechanism to bind an identity or role uh, to that certificate. So for us, we have two principles. There's root and uh, pariah. Um, they basically do the same thing. Some systems are much more sensitive about being a root user. Um, and so we have two just for, to make those happy. And so when you, when you create your certificate, you're going to pass in these principles. So this is basically saying, hey, I have these two roles. I can be root. I can be uh, uh, one of the pariah. And what happens is when you log into a server, SSH is going to check the principles uh, that are in the certificate against what you've put on the server. And there's basically a directory that's per user, and the contents of that need to match what's in their certificate. Now, there's, there's nothing magic about this underscore everywhere. Uh, Facebook came up with a blueprint for how to do this. If you're curious, go find their stuff. It's, it's a really good read, um, and it spells out everything. So now that we have authenticated, uh, the, the last piece of the puzzle is we add a sedewer's rule that allows one of these principles to get root privileges uh, without a password. And so now we can 
authenticate the system. The systems can authenticate the users. Those specific users can now uh, log in without a, a password, just using their, their key, and they can get root privileges um, without a password. And so with that, now we can do all of our Ansible automation um, automatically. Um, the user side is, is very similar. Um, you're going you're gonna to pull the, the key and the passphrase from the vault, sign the user's key, and um, copy their certificate to the home directory. Now, one of the things that is interesting about this whole setup is as a part of signing the user's certificate, you're actually going to put their real ID in there, so their, their corporate email address, their uh, login ID, or something. And the reason this is nice is that now when everybody logs in with that same account, SSH is going to track who that user is that's, a, that's attached to that certificate. So now even though everybody is using the same login, you can keep track of who did what and when. Now, the real reason, the, the main reason that we did this was to basically not need to manage uh, authorized keys file on every system. We could have used Ansible to do it, um, but this seemed uh, like a lot, easy, a lot easier thing. But in the course of doing this, we found a number of really nice other properties. So we've had occasion where we've had to have people from outside of our group come in and do things on the servers. And what we could do is we could ask them for an SSH key, and then you can sign that certificate either for a long time, like we do for the main members of the group, or a very short time. So we had a consultant that needed to come in. We signed his certificate for four hours. So after that four hours time period expired, his certificate no longer worked. So this kind of gives you a way to lock people out or constrain access. Now, Facebook takes this to a whole other level. Um, and manages everything with timeouts. We kept our life simple and just did the long timeouts for the, uh, our regular team. Um, the other nice things that you get out of this is uh, no more trust on first use or host key checkup warnings, which is really nice. Again, we re-image servers a lot, um, and so not seeing those are, are great. Um, plus, it gives us some security. So if in, in a catastrophe where we've we've lost uh, a, a key, we have a way to protect the rest of the systems and, and basically ban that. And like I showed, uh, we have a way to still determine who performed what actions. That's it. Questions? The question was, what other features in master.password do we take advantage of, like setting a timeout? We don't, but we probably should. We have not had to do any null. Uh, th so the question was, uh, do we have to use nullfs in conjunction with NFS? Um, uh, we haven't. We haven't had to do that. We do use nullfs, but but not for that. Uh, the, 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 the observation was uh, we're using NFS v4, uh, but we're still individually mounting every user's home, separately mounting every user's home directory. Um, it's a, uh, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plead ignorance and, and holding it wrong, maybe. Um, please teach me. Again, accidental sysadmin. There could, I am 100% positive that there are very laughable things that I've, I've shown you, um, but uh, eh. 
you consider the tax on it? Did we, well, uh, the question is, did we uh, consider SysPack for Ansible? Um, I don't know what that is, so probably. Okay, sweet. Yep. Did you consider other, other types of authentication, like LDAP or uh, uh, yeah, Yes, did we consider other forms of authentication like, like LDAP? Um, no, um, the, the systems uh, all used NIS. And so that was a part of just, again, there, there, there are probably better ways to set things up, but I wasn't about ready to go reconfigure 50 servers. It was, it was a, um, 90 days sounds like a lot. Um, it, it turns out it's not. So there was a, it was a mad scramble and it really was, I mean, the important thing was don't mess with those servers. Um, Very wise observation that I won't repeat because I'll butcher it, and it was it was it was lovely. Mr. Dexter. Just for a comment, site reservation. This is the way. Watch out for appliances that insist on fixed addresses. You see servers on fixed addresses. Not allowed to take pictures. No, we really want that. Yeah, the the, uh, the the comment was uh, DHCP reservations is the way. Um, I felt weird about implementing DHCP reservations initially, but I'm a gigantic fan now. <laughs> Especially since uh, the, the other thing to, to comment about the static addressing is um, Big Corp is dysfunctional. Um, they have a, I know, this, that's a shock to everyone. The room is laughing. Um, there is a group that manages DHCP. There is a group that manages DNS. Uh, best that we can tell, they hate each other and don't talk. So, so nice things like dynamic DNS and, and those sorts of things that you would really like are impossible. Uh, the question was about uh, randomized Macs. Um, so our infrastructure doesn't include any wireless stuff. So this is this is purely in a lab. Um, it's really only fixed things, uh, hardwired things that are attaching to it. And we're actually it's it's a little bit um, we, we, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, one more. So what what do you see tomorrow? The question is, what do you see for tomorrow to add to this infrastructure? Um, that is a good question. Um, I don't know. What should we do? There's a, there is a little bit of um, uh, the 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 uh, open kimono answer is. Um, uh, like I, I kind of hinted at, we, we do a lot of uh, server re-imaging. We need a better way of doing that. That's, that's probably the next big thing. But it, it, um, the, the other thing is we've now had this set up for uh, going on a year and ish, and we've done almost nothing. So, so that initial premise that what app, WhatsApp laid out of it just basically works, that's been our experience. And it's been great because I don't have time to also deal with the care and feeding. Now, my team um, uh, is also really been great in this, um, and they've been a big help. But no, no immediate plans. Get actually get our real the real part of our job done. <laughs> Uh, so as a, as as a, the the backup stuff, I I blew by really quickly. But yes, that's that's so we're doing uh, the the backup 
does regular rotating snapshots and uh, replicates them to another system and, and does, um, to, to my thinking, fairly grown up things. I mean, I'm impressed, I shouldn't be, but you know, it feels very grown up. All right, thank you everybody.